All right. I am so excited to officially kick off tonight's webinar. So welcome to the webinar, First Financial and Risk Management Steps for Any Career Path in Dentistry. This webinar is sponsored by Career Compass and Trailer and High School's Business Brush Up Series. This is the second webinar in that series. I'm Kendra Johnson, and I am the Senior Manager of Publishers and Programs at ASDA, and I'm one of the 15 staff members that are here on site at ASDA. Before we get started, I just have a couple of announcements. All attendees are muted so that we don't pick up any background noise during the program, and the webinar will be recorded and posted to ASDA's website. A link will be emailed to everyone who registered tonight. And again, if you have any, if any issues with receiving that information, don't hesitate to email ASA, and we'll make sure that you get a copy of tonight's webinar. Right. So, as the launch, Career Compass, let me just move my slide along here. There we go. As the launch, Career Compass in April of 2017 to help ensure students prepare are prepared for graduation and can transition, excuse me, successfully to the first step in their career. The website has resources for graduation, different career offers options, postgraduate programs, getting a job, and financial practice management, such as tonight's webinar. We also hold monthly webinars on topics that will help you begin your dental career. ASDA will continue to develop additional programs and resources for Career Compass and work with experts in the field, such as Trailer and High School, on valuable content for all of our members. During tonight's program, you are able to ask questions of the presenters. So Christian is able to field questions throughout the program, or you're welcome to save your questions until the end. Totally up to you. You'll notice at the control panel there on the right hand of your screen, there's a red box that highlights where you guys can type in questions, and we encourage that again throughout the presentation. We will provide contact information for the presenters and for Career Compass at the end of the presentation. So if you ever have any questions or you want to follow up with someone after the presentation, we'll provide that information for you as well. All right, so tonight's speaker is Christian Pearson, and he is with the, he is with Trailer High School, and he is the National Director of Dental Partnerships. Christian is Trailer and High School's National Director of Dental Partnerships, as I just said. Um, and in this capacity, he oversees outreach to general dentistry programs throughout the country, through which he can deliver specialized expertise. Trailer and High School was founded in 1959, and the firm has a solid reputation for quality products and its knowledge of the particular financial service needs of those in the medical and dental professionals. Christian develops business symposia, lectures, and other educational events, such as tonight's webinar, to help launch students' dental career on a solid foundation. So I'd now like to turn it over to Christian to share a little bit on the Business Brush Up series. Thanks, Kendra. Welcome, everybody, and good evening. Uh, just a, uh, another great opportunity to be with you all, and appreciate you logging in. Uh, business Brush Up is something new here with us and with ASDA that we're working to continue to build and promote. So we're always looking for your feedback on additional topics and things that you'd want to learn more about. Uh, but uh, us at TreeLearn High School, a company that you're gonna hear a little bit about tonight uh, that works a lot with dentists around the country. We know that you get a great, great uh, amount of training to be tremendous scientists and be tremendous dentists in your field, but often the business side of things isn't always emphasized during your dental training. So we're trying to help fill that void and give you some important information as you move into the next stage of your career. Wonderful. And Christian, I will go ahead and change the presentation over to you. And if you want to get us started, we look forward to tonight's presentation. Great, Kendra. Thank you. All righty. Can everybody see my screen okay there? I think that is a yes. All right, uh, like Kendra said, I'm Christian. I'm our National Director of Dental Partnerships. Been with Tremor High School for 15 years now. Uh, started with them right out of college. Uh, owe a lot to dentistry. I met my wife at a dentist's office in Tampa. Been married now 11 years and uh, have two little girls and have another one coming, not sure boy or girl yet, in November. So it's been a, a fun run. Uh, I'm located in Tampa, but I travel all over the country with the company. Uh, currently presenting to you right now from our headquarters office just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So 
we'll look forward to seeing a lot of you, hopefully, too, at the national meeting uh, coming up next year. But uh, let's go ahead and get into the presentation here. And joining me also on this call is Andrew Rickard. Andrew is one of our regional directors out of our home office here in uh, Pittsburgh. Andrew covers Ohio, Michigan, Kentucky, Western New York, uh, West Virginia, and Western Pennsylvania for us in Indiana. So, uh, Andrew, thank you for coming on and uh, look forward to having his input on this uh, as we move through as well. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Christian. Um, I'm looking forward to being your color commentary here. That's right. right. Thanks, buddy. Okay, so we started we started in 1959. We uh, have over 19,000 clients that are all dentists. So it's a very specialized uh, group that we work with uh, at the company and really just focus on your needs as a professional and as a practitioner to understand all the uh, things that you have to overcome with paying off student loans and, and building your practice and growing your wealth. So we really are specialists in your industry to understand your profession and understand how we can help you. Uh, Trillard High School as a company has multiple divisions within it, a wealth management division, teenage wealth management, risk management division that just helps you with all your uh, insurance needs when it comes to owning a practice, a building, having employees, et cetera, and a lot of your individual risk management and financial planning as well. So it's a, it's a specialty group. Uh, we're all very proud to work for them and uh, look forward to giving you guys some great wisdom of the knowledge that we have over all these years of working with just people in your profession. Uh, so we're going to get to the basics here and give you some uh, good, uh, you know, ground to stand on as you move into the next phase. So talk about your financial base. We're going to talk about cash flow, some things with debt management and student loans. We know that's a big issue that a lot of you are trying to figure out what you're going to do with next. Uh, how you do a good financial analysis of your life and, and trying to meet your goals and writing a good plan, uh, creating help, uh, helping with tax savings and retirement plans, and then some basic information on investing and risk management as well. So with dentistry, it's a unique profession because you have an ability to make a tremendous income year after year after year after year. But your practice itself, if you own a business, doesn't have a tremendous multiple value to sell. You can't go into retirement at age 65, and if you're producing a million dollars in dentistry, someone's not going to buy your practice for five or ten million dollars. It's just not how the industry is function uh, when it comes to a sale. So your job and our job is to help you protect your income, protect your wealth, and grow it year after year, and take portions of your income and turn it into savings, and turn it into um, planning for retirement, turning it into you know, reducing debt, etc. So it's a it's a difficult task because it takes some discipline, it takes some organization, but it's all things that are very, very possible to do with the, with the right plan in hand. But you have to understand that your income is really your largest asset. So the basics here of your financial pyramid, the pyramid being you know, the strongest found, uh, structure out there, all develops off of a, found, a strong uh, base. And that's gonna be in a financial plan, cash flow, liquidity, your basic risk management with your insurances, a will, uh, if you have family and, and kids, uh, power of attorney, et cetera, you don't know, some, you know, some basics on an estate plan uh, written together for you as well. When you move through the pyramid higher, you're going to have more uh, needs to develop when it comes to saving for retirement and, and doing things that are maybe a little bit more fun to talk about than the basics. But you have to build the basics first. You have to manage cash flow and then do these things right at the beginning. So let's go through some of that. Uh, a lot of it at the beginning is risk management, a strong cash position, understanding how to manage your debts, and doing a basic estate plan. So when it comes to risk management, you have to understand really what that is. And, and a lot of it is, is shouldered with insurance, where you're going to take dollars out of your pocket and buy insurance policies that cover what we would say is an unaffordable uh, or catastrophic loss. I give an example of you buy, if you buy a house, you're gonna buy homeowner's insurance. But if you buy a toaster, you're not gonna buy toaster insurance. You're gonna be able to recover from losing your toaster. You may not be able to financially recover from losing your house. And that is a big, big factor that you wanna consider whenever you're thinking about what types of things you need to insure. And your income is one of the biggest ones, and it's not the biggest. Your ability to make money year after year as a specialist or the dental practitioner is your largest asset. So having the right disability insurance is so, so critical at the beginning of your career. 
Also, life insurance, if you have a premature death, if you have a young family, or if you have other uh, debts to creditors, you want to make sure you have the right life insurance policies in place. And if you have claims against you by others, whether it be from a malpractice suit or personal, if there's any kind of liability that you would be responsible for, if you want to make sure you have those gaps filled uh, and you know, move into different phases of your life, and loss of property. Or other Andrew, do you want to add to that, bud? Yeah, I, would, I was going to say that you, you build the base relatively quickly. You, you buy your insurance products and, and you're able to figure out cash flow. Um, you're not in the foundation stage for very long, but you're in the next stages for very long. So you need to make sure that when you are purchasing the insurance products that you're really making the right decisions because that base is something that once you make those decisions, oftentimes, especially when buying the insurance products, you don't typically make changes to those things. You may make tweaks or adjustments, but when you buy those, you really want to make sure you make the right choice on what products you're using to make sure that you're properly insuring those risks for the next 30 years, maybe, or longer. Right. That's a great point. Yeah, it doesn't take long to get this stuff done, but it is a little bit of labor to get it done correctly. So next step of that, you know, building the base is managing your cash flow. And, you know, this is really the first part of a financial plan is, is developing a budget, understanding what your, what your liabilities are in the form of taxes, and then developing a plan for your surplus. What are you going to do with it? Is it going to be debt reduction? Are you going to save money with it? Are you going to invest? Are you going to buy a practice, et cetera? And building a solid emergency fund. Basic financial planning is going to say three to six months of spending is going to be a good foundation for an emergency fund. Some may need more, some may need less, but three to six months is a pretty good target. And with a, with a, really with any financial plan, I use the analogy of if you are have a gym membership, you may go from time to time. But if you bring in a, a financial planner and you engage somebody to, to help you with these services, it's like, it's like hiring a trainer. It's going to force you to get to the gym. It's going to force you to be healthier. It's going to force you to work out. And that's really what a financial planner can do, too, and this is to get these tedious things out of the way, help you writing a budget, help you understanding your tax situation, helping you understand where you're going to need to be as, as far as savings and debt reduction. So that's a, that's a big point. Let me circle back to the tax side of things. A lot of you are going to come out right away and not own a practice, but you're going to work for somebody or work for a larger conglomerate. And you're either going to be a W-2 employee or you're going to be a 1099 independent contractor. Lots of times that's decided for you depending on how the employer wants you to be paid. You don't often have the choice to say, I want to be a W-2 employee or I want to be a 1099 independent contractor. Understand that if you are a W-2 employee, for any of those that have had jobs before they, you know, in other occupations, you probably were W-2 where the uh, withholdings were taken out of your paycheck for your federal and state taxes and your FICA taxes, your payroll taxes. But if you're an independent contractor, that money comes to you 100%, and then it's your responsibility to figure out what you're going to owe in taxes and what you're going to owe for payroll taxes. So we always want to be aware of that situation so you don't fall into a tax trap because you could look at your income and say, I made a lot of money this year. I'm a 1099 uh, contractor, but a big chunk of that's going to be in the form of taxes you're going to owe. So you have to be conscious of that and know how you're being paid and and be ahead of that. And we always want you to uh, seek the advice of a CPA and accountant that's doing the work with dentistry to get you in that stage, you know, with our help and their help to make sure that you don't have a big trap that you fall into uh, in the early stages of your career. What should pay up your loans wisely to, uh, you know, a lot of people tell us, uh, you know, I, I really want to be uh, away from all my debt. I want to pay off all my student loans as fast as I can. I want to pay off my house as fast as I can or my business loans as fast as I can. And we understand that from a mentality standpoint to be completely debt free. It's a, it's a good financial situation to be in if you don't have the debts. But understand too that sometimes going too aggressive on your debt repayment could hinder future abilities for cash flow to either grow your business or buy a practice because you've sucked all your money into debt repayment and haven't done maybe some of the other basics like building an emergency fund or getting the right insurances or having a surplus that you can then spend to potentially make more money. Uh, maybe if it were to be buying another practice or to be buying a partner out. So 
So to have the cash available to do those kind of things in coordination with the debt service that you're going to have to tackle is things that you're going to want to figure out and, and you know, kind of get coached through so that you're making the best decisions possible with the money that you're making. Andrew, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I just, just to build on what you said, I mean, it's, uh, we see a lot of dentists that are, are so debt averse that they're debt averse to a fault and their goals are to pay off all their debt, even home and, and things like that, student loans, get it paid down as quickly as they can. And they neglect some of the other areas that they need to be also addressing. So things right. with that financial plan be, get, get out of whack. Just like in, in anything in life, balance is good. A balanced approach to debt management and long-term planning for retirement is, is typically a more reasonable way to approach it. Right, right. And you want to you want to know who you are as far as what your risk or what your tolerance is, but uh, understand that there's there's things that you want to be aware of there. So, okay, so the student loans, the you know thousand pound gorilla in the room here. You know, what are your what are your options and how are you going to go to uh, tackle these things? Now you do have some time after you graduate to kind of figure things out as far as what your strategy is going to be. The, you know, the default is going to be to a ten year repayment on these student loans. So that's what most government uh, loans that you're going to have. And a lot of people are going to go and, and take the income-based repayment option because at the beginning, that's actually a nice way to have a lot of uh, better cash flow because your payments are going to be less. Long-term, it's not the greatest method to go to because it doesn't get you to the goal line in any reasonable way. Uh, but a lot of our clients are going to look at refinancing and, and getting into a more sensible option, which is what uh, we're going to talk about next. Understand there's a difference between refinancing and consolidation. Consolidation just takes all your loans at different interest rates that you may have, 6.8, 7.9, et cetera. And you may have four or five or six loans and squishes it into one loan and, and makes it one payment. It's not a savings because all the interest is weighted and it's going to be uh, just paid in one amount. It might be nice from a convenience standpoint, but it's not going to gain any, anything financially. The way we see a lot more people go is to reconsolidate or uh, refinance your loans where you're going to get a outside lender or a private bank to buy your government loans from you and then you have a uh, private loan with whoever may be a common bond and, and you know there's others that are out there too that'll refinance these loans for you the rates are typically lower than what you're going to pay with the government rates but there's uh, things that you want to consider before you go down this road is that a lot of these banks are going to want, to want you to show income to qualify. So if you go and try to apply for a private loan right now as a dental student or a recent resident graduating, you don't have any income yet, they may not look at you as a, as a great risk or at a very good risk right now and may not be able to give you that good of an interest rate or that good of an offer. So we tend to see people maybe go six months to a year after graduation before they get serious about refinancing the student debt and then creating a better financial situation for themselves because they've then lowered their interest rates and lowered their payments to be able to then tackle these loans in a more reasonable fashion. Uh, Andrew, anything you want to add there? Yeah, maybe maybe address the common misconception of uh, debt forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we hear some people say is that I'll just pay the minimum and my debt will continue to balloon and whenever I get to a, a point in time that the, that, the, that the time that I was going to pay these loans back to the government is now over, you still have a, an amount of principal that's due to you, uh, to, the, to the government. That's not forgiven. The way the government handles that is they say, if you still owe us a half a million dollars, that half a million dollars gets tacked onto your tax return in the form of a 1099, and now you owe taxes on that half a million dollars. So if you don't have... $200,000 ready to go to pay those taxes, then you haven't done yourself any favors. So most people aren't planning for that. And so it's a misconception really as far as how uh, for debt forgiveness really works for successful people like you. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not built that way. Okay, so now that we've got some of the basics out of the way, we want you to move up your financial pyramid into you know the growing assets phase. This is the, like Andrew said, the 
the phase that you're in longer, it's a lot more fun to be in this phase than it is at the, at the, the base phase. But these are things like determining your target savings goals, retirement, if you're going to provide an education for your kids, what that's going to take from a savings factor, other goals you may have, an additional practice, a vacation home, uh, you know, a boat, whatever it is, uh, that you're going to want to build savings over time to be able to try to meet those goals. Um, and, and this is where it's fun for our clients and us, too, because you got to this stage in your life not on accident. You had a purpose for everything you've done to get to this point, to either get through dental school or get through residency. Your goal-oriented people, this is the same thing. You're applying goals, but just to a financial setting uh, to try to get to the next phase and get there faster or easier or better. So that's, that's nice for us because our clients are all like you, that their life has purpose and their, their goals have purpose and their financial plan wants to have a purpose too. And that's, that's a fun place for us to work in, to work with successful and, and uh, exciting people that want to, want to get there. So start with that as far as knowing what your goals are and, and write them out. It's always important to write out your goals no matter what stage of life you're in or what you're trying to accomplish. We'd love you to be able to use tax advantage savings plans too, depending on what situation you're in, whether it be retirement plans inside your practice or being able to use some 529 college savings plans for your uh, kids' um, education. There's, there's nice ways to save some money there from taxes using certain plans. And you want to create an asset allocation strategy aligned with your goals. And, and there's asset allocation strategies out there that are high risk, low risk, et cetera. Um, there's asset allocation strategies that will align with your values too, whether if it's Maybe you don't want to invest in companies that, uh, you know, sell tobacco or firearms or uh, whatever it may be that's important to you. There's, there's value uh, assets out there, too, that, that people uh, provide and, and do a great job to, to give our clients options with as well. So let's talk quickly about the tax savings of a, of a uh, retirement plan through yourself or through your business, depending on how you're established. You know, if you're an independent contractor and you're by yourself, a lot of people are going to be able to put money into a SEP. And a SEP allows you to have a up to $55,000 contribution. You know, you have to have the income to get there, but it provides almost $19,000 tax savings in that year to put that money away for retirement. And then what we see a lot of our clients do that own a practice and have employees is a 401k safe harbor or a simple plan. Those are out there. And if you're just by yourself and you're just kind of getting going, maybe a basic IRA or a Roth IRA, depending on how high your income is, is a good place to get started. And I'll say that the sooner you can get started and the, the more disciplined you can get in your savings, the more successful people become because it's a habit and it's a, just building towards, you know, accomplishing that goal. Real quickly on in, the impact of negative returns. This is an interesting little study. So, we have two portfolios here. If you look all the way to the left, you're going to see two $100,000 investments in portfolio one and two. And at the end, if you look all the way to the right, you'll see that portfolio two outperformed portfolio one over this five-year period. And the question is, how'd that happen? But what's interesting is both portfolios, if you look up at the average annual return, both got a 10% average return. So why did portfolio two do better than portfolio one? Portfolio one actually was better in years one three, and five. It outperformed portfolio two. But in years two and four, there was a downturn in the market, but portfolio two didn't lose as much as portfolio one. So this is an illustration to help you understand that although good years are good, when bad years are bad, you want to try to mitigate some of those losses and be in a, in a potentially more well-rounded portfolio to, to ride out some of the waves. Uh, a quick example for you, if you had this $100,000 in invested in year one, you lost 50% of your portfolio, you'd be down to 50,000. In year two, if you had a 50% gain, a lot of people's answer is I would be back to 100. I lost 50%, now I'm gaining 50%. But the truth is, you're going to go from 50,000 to 75, because it's off of where you were at. So you'd have to have another positive year of pretty substantial returns just to get back to where you started. So understand that negative returns often can hurt you more than positive returns can help you. So how do you get to a point where you might be able to mitigate some of your lower returns? And that's the, you know, the crystal ball question. This example here shows this kind of what looks like maybe a periodic chart of investments uh, of different years. So this is from 1997 
the 2015 on um, different asset classes and where they fell each year based on the market in different categories. So you can see in 97, large cap value stocks were up 35 percent, you know, and they keep moving throughout the chart. What's interesting is as you look into things like in 2008, when the market was really having a tough year, large cap growth stocks down there, second from the last, were down 38%. But in the next year, they were up. They were the top one, up almost 37%. So what this also illustrates from a, a uh, emotion of the investor standpoint is that if you were a panicked investor in 2008 and you were mostly invested in large cap uh, value core or growth stocks and you sold out, you would have missed out on all the positive returns in that following year. You would have been done the opposite of what Warren Buffett and some of the other successful investors do is you would have sold low and then be buying high. And obviously you want to do the opposite. You want to, you want to be able to uh, buy low and sell high. So this is just an interesting way to understand that you need diversification in your portfolio that you're not always going to be able to pick the winner every year. You want to be able to have some balance to get to the right spot. So putting it all together, evaluate and cover your insurance fees, analyze your target savings for retirement and education, utilize the right buckets for your retirement plan, whether it be an IRA, a SEP, a 401k, a simple, align your portfolio with your plan so that you're going to be able to meet the goals, hopefully, as you move throughout your career, and then benchmark your progress and adjust accordingly. There's a reason why you tell all of us out there in the world that come to see you that you want to, if you're a general dentist, you want to see me every six months. Right? You don't want me to come every six years and then hope that nothing bad happened in six years and now it's going to be a complete nightmare with my oral health. Same with this. You want to be able to review your financial progress on a regular basis with your advisors. Understand that if you need to make changes, you need to make them as you go, not in big chunks of time, but maybe in smaller chunks of time. And really early in your career, too, to set up, like Andrew said, setting up the base uh, products and getting yourself in the right spot. You need to be in constant communication with your advisors to get you where you need to be but then checking it on a regular basis so that you don't have a situation where you go ignorance is bliss for a long period of time and then realize, uh-oh, uh, I've been going down the wrong path and now I've got to change courses and, and now I've lost that time to make those decisions. So, Andrew, anything you want to add in here, partner? No, I think I think you did a good job of putting it in, in perspective uh, for the audience. I think it's something, too, you, you said, ignorance is bliss and that's what I probably find that the majority of the time people who don't address their financial situation are, are people who don't want to address their financial situation and the quicker that you do it and the earlier that you get in a habit of doing it the easier it is for the rest of your career and it's not something that you're having to play catch up on or, or develop new habits and break old habits. So the, the earlier that you can get on the right track, the better. Absolutely, yep, absolutely. So some other things we wanna talk about, some risk management things where you need to have addressed. You know, we, understand, we all kind of talk a little bit about the rule of insurance, what to insure, selecting the right insurance policies, determining appropriate coverage for your future. Let's take a quick little dive into this here, and then we're gonna have some time for some questions here at the end. So selecting an insurance policy, you, know, you want to understand the company's strength, ratings, industry reputation. You might own an insurance contract for 30 years, maybe longer. So understanding, is that company going to be reputable to be around for a long period of time? Do they have the financial backing to be there when you need them? Uh, it's very, very important and often overlooked. Understanding the language inside your policy. You don't have to be a savant, but you want to know how it functions and what's the value for the, for the dollars you're going to spend to be protected in the right capacity. So understanding first the strengths of companies, you can see the different uh, categories here with the different rating organizations that are out there to evaluate the validity of, of insurance and, and financial companies. So we always want you to be as close to the top as possible with AMS, Standards & Poor's, Moody's, you guys have probably heard some of these names. So knowing their rankings and where they, how they classify companies and, and insurance contracts is very, very important to, to know. Uh, depending, too, on what your situation is, you're going to have different 
uh, needs. You know, some of you are going to go out and be an associate at a private practice. Some of you are going to work for a, a DSO or a big corporate group. Some of you are going to start your own practice, maybe not right away, but maybe, maybe the first couple of years. You might go out and partner with another friend of yours and start a business together. You may stay on as faculty for a little while and, and work in a faculty practice. Uh, some of you may go in the military and, and uh, dissolve some of your student debts there and, and, and uh, serve in the Armed Forces side of things with dentistry as well. So the different needs for different categories, we're going to break these out here uh, based on your situation. Everybody is going to have to address getting disability insurance. We talked about at the beginning, your biggest asset is what? It's your income. It's your ability to make money. It's your ability to perform dentistry tasks on a daily basis day after day, year after year, to, to make the income that you're going to generate. Protecting it is paramount, and having the right disability coverage is critical to making sure that that largest asset is protected. So it's an adjusted insurance policy. It's going to replace a percentage of your income. If you can't perform the duties of your job due to injury or sickness. It's a pretty straightforward type of coverage. There are some factors to it, though, that you want to understand how it works. Understand the basics of it. The premium is just what you spend. So Premium is the cost, all right? A benefit amount is how long a company is going to have to pay you should you become disabled. An elimination period is how long in time you have to be disabled before the insurance company starts to pay you. So we all have auto insurance. Uh, if you don't have auto insurance, stop this presentation and go get it. But if you, if you do, you have an elimination period, which is similar to a deductible. A deductible is your auto insurance that says if you get into an accident, you may owe the first $500 or $1,000 of, of cost to the uh, expense of the accident, and the insurance company is going to pay the rest. This is the same with the elimination period, meaning that you have to satisfy the amount of days first to be disabled before the insurance company is then going to kick in and start paying you. A benefit period is, uh, again, our, I said benefit amount before I started about a benefit period. Benefit amount is how much the company is going to pay you. And then you're going to have riders that are going to enhance your coverage. And we're going to talk about that in more detail to make your policy more robust. And there also could be exclusions on your coverage, depending on your health history uh, and medical history. That, that the company may say, we may not cover you for certain things, too, that you find out how that would work through an evaluation called underwriting. And underwriting is simply the process of going through the insurance company's eyes to see how, what the risk is to them to then insure you with a policy. So again, disability insurance, who needs it, how much should you get, and when should you obtain it? Who needs it? All of you should have it. It's by far one of the most important, if not the most important insurance you could buy as a dental to practitioner. How much you should get could be based on if you're a student, if you're a resident, if you're a recent graduate, or if you're out of private practice, what's your income? So disability uh, when you're in private practice, it's based on how much money you're making and what the insurance company is then going to give you. There's limits that you can qualify for as a student that you don't have to show a tax return or an income to still qualify for a good amount of coverage when you're getting out of, out of uh, dental school or out of residency. When should you obtain it? As soon as you can afford it, really, is the best way to think about it. And there's ways to tailor your, your pricing on this so that you can still get very effective coverage and not spend a lot of money at the beginning and then build on it as you go through your career. But we never know what tomorrow may bring. So to be able to protect yourself and protect your, your health and your, and your ability to get more later is critical. So again, there's everyone that's going to need an individual insurance contract. And even though some of these situations may provide you with some coverage, a dental service organization, a faculty practice may provide it, armed services may provide it, you're still going to want to have some of your own so that when that situation ends, you have something to take with you. If you work for a dental service organization and you leave, they don't say, hey, thanks for working for us. Why don't you take all your benefits with you? They say, that's over because you don't work for us anymore. So you want to have your own coverage to be able to carry with you as you move throughout your career. So it's important to understand this, too. You're going to, you're going to want to have a non-cancelable and guaranteed renewable policy. So in insurance language, that means that the insurance company can't change your policy and can't change your rates and can't take it away from you. As opposed to a group contract where the group controls the policy, you're a part of the group or you're a part of the corporate contract. They control the premiums. They control the contract. They control how things work. It's not up to you. 
So we want people to have individually owned, non-cancelable and guaranteed renewable policies as often as they can. You want to have an own occupation definition as well. This protects your uh, ability that if you were a clinical dentist 100% of the time and you became disabled because you couldn't operate the handpiece correctly uh, or you had a situation where you have nerve damage or something or it's your back, whatever it may be that you're not able to perform the, the clinical material and substantial duties of clinical dentistry, that you could still go work in another field, be it teaching, consulting, maybe you're an um, implant rep, you're, you're still able to work and make an income, but you're not going to lose any of your disability benefits because you have this own occupation rider on your coverage. You're going to want to also have partial disability or residual. A lot of our clients suffer a situation where they can, they can still work as a dentist, but they can't work at a full capacity. So you're going to want to be able to be paid for the loss of income due to the restriction of your uh, daily ability to do your job. You may only be able to work three days a week instead of five. You may only be able to work four hours a day instead of eight. That's going to reduce your income because you're not producing as much. You're not seeing as many patients. You can still do dentistry. You just can't do it at a full capacity. That's where partial is going to come into the picture. The last one on here, too, is an increase option. This is going to allow you to buy more benefits in the future as your income goes up, which we all want that to happen. Your income is going to go up. We want you to be able to protect that higher income, but without having to go through a medical exam and answer new questions about your health currently to buy more coverage. This option allows you to show a company your tax returns, show them where your income is now at, and then increase your coverage based on the higher income that you've now achieved. So it's a very, very critical option and one that you want to make sure that you understand how it works whenever you're going to be working in the future to exercise additional coverage to protect a higher living, a higher lifestyle, et cetera. Andrew, anything you want to add on the disability? Um, just in, in, case, in, in terms of who needs it, you all have, have to have to get disability insurance, like Christian said, and, and whatever course of action or, or career path you choose, disability insurance is absolutely the most important insurance that you're going to buy. And I, I liken it to the terms of, you know, and many of you may have student student loan debt, right? Think of, think of and upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Think if you were to buy a business for $400,000, the first thing that you would think is what are the risks that could potentially derail this business? Well, in your world, you're the business. So you have to protect against these risks. Disability is just because of the nature of your business is the, the most likely risk to you losing that income stream. So get it as soon as you can. Uh, get as much, as you, of you can, uh, much of it as you can. But everyone, everyone in here is going to need it. Absolutely. Other thing you might need, depending on what your situation is, is life insurance. All this is is a death benefit that would be paid to your, uh, to debtors or to loved ones if you were to die. Who needs it depends on the situation and what you're presented with, and how much is also depending on your family situation and your debt that you may have to repay. Uh, again, the term is premium. That's how much you're, uh, that's the cost to own the, the policy or own the coverage. A death benefit or a face value is the amount of coverage that you would buy that if you did pass away would go to your loved ones or go to debtors uh, that you would have. Uh, there's a primary and a contingent beneficiary. Uh, I'm married. If something were to happen to me and my wife and she were to pass away, the contingent beneficiary would be our children so that they would get my proceeds for the life insurance if she wasn't able to get them. Uh, and then some contracts can have a cash value, and the cash value uh, is in a permanent life contract where it grows in, in, in value over time. But let's talk about that in a little bit more detail, that, again, all of, all of you in these categories are going to need maybe some type of life insurance. And there's two types. There's term and there's permanent. I give the example of term as like renting an apartment. You're going to pay your rent for a 12-month period, and if you move out of the apartment, the landlord doesn't come to you and say, you were a great landlord, here's all your money back. They say, thanks for renting from me, see you later. And that's what term insurance is, is you're borrowing the insurance from the insurance company 
If you don't pass away, they don't give you your money back. Um, if you do pass away, there's a death benefit paid to your primary beneficiary. If, if you needed other type of insurance, it's called permanent. And it'll, at the beginning of your career, term is going to be the place where a lot of you are going to start. It's a less expensive contract that allows you to buy a lot of death benefits. As you grow uh, financially, a lot of our clients are blending in some permanent life into their life insurance portfolio. It grows uh, in a tax advantage situation. It's got some other intrinsic values that a lot of our affluent clients like from estate planning needs and, and other um, financial situations, but it's permanent, right? Understand the two words there. This is a policy that's never going to expire. You're not going to outlive permanent insurance. There's always going to be a death benefit or a face value paid to your loved ones. So it's something that maybe isn't appropriate right now, but something you want to think about as you move through your financial life and look for other places to be able to save money. Last thing you're going to want to talk about is professional liability. And, you know, again, what is, what is it? It's your protection against a patient suing you and, and the result of that. Who needs it? This is going to be everybody in some capacity, depending on your practice situation. And how much should you have is going to be predicated on be where you work and what kind of practice you're doing and what kind of, uh, what kind of surgeries and, and different dental tasks you're doing uh, with your patients. So again, the word is premium. How much you're paying is what it costs. That's the premium. You're going to have a coverage limit or how much the insurance company would pay on your behalf if the suit was settled against you to be paid to a plaintiff. There's two types of coverage. There's occurrence and there's claims made. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then there's a consent clause, and the consent is how is the suit brought to you as far as what are your options as a defendant with the insurance company to fight the claim. So let's talk about all of these. Who needs them, again, is going to be different. If you're an associate, you'd have your own coverage. If you work for a dental service organization, I've been doing this for 15 years now, 10 or 12 years ago, a lot of dental service organizations let you have your own malpractice, and then you go work for them. A lot of the bigger corporations now have kind of buttoned up their employment contracts, so you have to use their malpractice. You can't bring your own coverage in anymore. It's in your employment contract that you have to go with their group malpractice policy. So you want to understand how that would work if you were to leave and, and what the consequences are. If you're a sole owner, you would have your own. If you and I owned a practice together, we'd have our own coverages, and we'd also cover the corporation as well uh, in the form of an entity policy. Faculty and armed forces, those are probably going to be covered by the school or by the military as far as the work you're doing there. But if you go in moonlight, those folks are going to need to have their own coverage for work they're doing outside of the school or outside of the military. And, and that's really the same with if you're a, a, a resident or a GPR and AGD and you're able to step outside of the residency program on a weekend and get some work done, you're going to want to have a moonlighting policy in place before you start so that you can go out there and, and do the work you want to do and be protected for any potential suits that could come your way. So what will cover? You know, different policy types, policy limits, and the consent to settle. This is going to be a little deeper dive here with the li liability. We like it if you have an occurrence contract. And understand that occurrence, understand the vocabulary where it's when the act occurred, when you did the procedure, is the policy that's going to respond when the suit comes in the future. So if you did a procedure today and you dropped your malpractice insurance tomorrow, you're covered forever for any lawsuit that were to come down the road because it's all based on when the act occurred. You had the policy in place today when you did that said procedure. Okay, so that's a big difference over a claims made policy where you need to have to buy a tail to cover your prior acts or you have to keep the claims made policy in effect to protect against any prior acts because it's all based on what when the claim is made. So it's not based on when the act occurred, it's what policy is available when the claim is filed. So it's two different types of coverage language that you want to understand. But we like occurrence, especially at the beginning, because you may bounce around a little bit. You may not be in the perfect practice right away. You may want to leave practice A and go to practice B. You may want to start in California and decide maybe this is the right place for me to practice and I'm going to move to you know, Nevada or Utah and set up practice there. With occurrence, you can pick up and go. There's what I call no back-end charges to occurrence. You've paid your premium, you're protected for everything that's happened from that point on, and you don't have to worry about buying the tail, which could be a multiple of your base policy. It's an unknown cost a lot of times for what a tail premium could be. So 
that often handcuffs some people financially to try to make that move and, and, and get to a better place where they can practice where they might be more successful. Know the different limits on where you're at. You've got a, you know, the industry standard for a long time has been 1 million, 3 million. We're seeing a lot of people move their coverage up to a higher amount, 2 million, 4 million, or not a lot of additional costs to go to that higher um, uh, coverage amount per claim and then aggregate in a policy year. So the first number is the amount per claim that they would pay. But if you had multiple suits against you, you'd have up to that 4 million number in the policy year. Then you have other options that have additional coverage as well. And depending on, like I said, what type of dentistry you're doing, I kind of say generically, the farther back in the head you go, the higher your limit should probably be. But again, everybody needs to understand what is important to them and, and where their value is as far as the cost to be protected appropriately. If there was a successful suit against you and there had to be a claim paid, how much would the insurance company be on the hook for uh, to cover that for you? We use medical protective a lot around the country. I know you guys at ASDA are all very familiar with them. But they have what's called a pure consent. And pure consent simply says that if you get sued, you have the ability to tell the insurance company, I want to be defended. You have to fight for me, defend my reputation. They can't settle the claim without your consent. So they can't just make the patient go away by writing a check, which is probably way less expensive for an insurance company to do than it would be to defend you with an expensive and effective attorney and go through the depositions and go through any kind of trial, et cetera, to get your reputation uh, you know, to where it should be defended appropriately. So we see this often that people don't always understand that they have pure consent until there is a lawsuit and they realize the insurance company has a lot more control than I do and I'm kind of stuck. So, um, Andrew, anything you want to add on this here, Pug? Yeah, I think that a lot of times when, when our, we see dentists analyzing malpractice insurance options, the first thing their eyes gravitate towards is price. And there's a big difference between price and value. Price isn't always necessarily, just the lowest price isn't always necessarily the best value. We want to make sure right. that you understand your rights what con with, in terms of consent clause. What company is standing behind the contract? Who is there? Who, what, what attorneys do these, these companies have access to to, to, to to defend you? So those are things that, that we spreadsheet and, and review. Medical protective happens to be when we're uh, checking all these boxes, uh, they, they happen to be the one that we feel provides the most value. Right. Absolutely. A great way to describe it. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about is a business owner's policy. And this is for those of you that are going to think about going out and starting a practice or owning a practice or being a partner in one. You know, this is your liability for um, property insurance, your equipment, workers' compensation if one of your employees gets hurt on, on your premises. Uh, if you have uh, employment practice liability, that's going to protect you against wrongful firing, sexual harassment, which is uh, always out there as a potential threat. And then data breach being another big one. You're doing so much with electronic records, sharing client or patient information between uh, maybe multiple practices. If it's a general dentist and metadata working together, you know, there's, a, there's an ability potentially for your patient's data to be compromised. You're going to want to have protection for that. So that all falls under a business owner's policy to be protected for all these other things that could happen to you uh, as a practice owner uh, as well. So, that's that on pretty much everything. Kendra, if you want to take back over control here and if there's any questions, we've got uh, probably a good 10 minutes here available left on the call to, uh, to field those. Kendra, I think we, are you on mute there? Do we got you? There we go. We just can't hear you.
Christian, can you hear me? I can hear you. I, I can't hear Kendra. Is there anything? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I was worried that I couldn't hear you any longer. Yeah. I'm not sure if everybody else could hear us, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, guys. Are. There we go. Okay, there we there go. There we go. Kendra. Perfect. All right. And were you guys able to hear the question I just asked, or should I re-ask it? No, if you could re-ask it. I, I didn't catch it. I'm sorry. Of course, yeah. So the first one we've got is, which type of malpractice insurance is better? It depends on your situation. If, at the beginning of your career, if you have a choice, we think the occurrence contract gives you more flexibility to make decisions as far as moving from practice to practice or even from state to state, depending on what's available uh, career-wise for you. It really it more depends on the company that you're being represented by and how their consent clause is written. That's more important in, even in the occurrence or the claims made. But having the company that's going to represent you, what you're really buying with malpractice is that you're basically paying a retainer for an attorney to defend you uh, if something were to happen in a, suit, in a malpractice suit. So knowing your consent clause is really the most critical thing, and having a pure consent is the only thing you really want to have is pure consent. Whether you have a claims made pure consent or a, an occurrence pure consent, mildly irrelevant in a, in a situation of a lawsuit because you're still going to be defended the right way. But if you can have the best of both, it would be an occurrence with a pure consent. Yeah, and, and most most companies do not offer pure consent because in, in, in dentistry, as far as the severity of lawsuits, a lot of times insurance companies can settle a claim for far less than what it's going to cost to pay the attorneys and the legal fees and the court costs to fight that same claim. So the insurance companies always want to keep the choice, whereas in reality, you want the choice whether or not to be able to defend yourself. Right. Absolutely. Perfect. All right. We have a few more questions. So the next one is, what other professional liability insurance companies would you recommend outside of Metro? Well, that would depend on your situation as well. You know, if those of you are going into a, a DSO market or even into a uh, situation with a, a, you're going to be an associate, um, there's going to be maybe a policy that's already available to you. And there's lots of insurance companies that are out there that represent uh, dentist or malpractice insurance. And I would say the, the, what your situation is would be find that out first so that then you can see what other options are out there uh, in, in, in that. And know too that you can only have one malpractice carrier. You can't have multiple companies to defend you. It's just one at a time. So you wanna be very careful with how you make that decision and, and know that if it is presented to you that you have to take the one that's brought to you by your employer, what are the consequences of coverage that's available? But Medco is the only one that works in every state it works nationally, so we're very comfortable with them on a national basis. Well, the other things that may come up may be more regionally based. Not knowing where that question came from would be part of the factor there, too. But I would say you, you want to know more about what, where you're going to work, what the setting is to see what other options are even available to you. Sure. And this question actually had a little more um, specifics that they were willing to share. So um, this individual is um, currently working for a company that MedPro does not cover in North Carolina. So they were just wondering if you had any specific recommendations. And for maybe the purpose for this attendee, I wonder if we could, if they wanted some more dialogue, they could always reach out to you, Christian, for maybe some more specific recommendations. But if you're not able to answer on, on the webinar. Yeah, I mean, there are places that MedPro won't, you know, uh, insure that maybe be in a group setting or sometimes they don't do emergency room or walk-in clinics or different things that, that are doing out there in dentistry. But I would, uh, if you'd like, please, uh, over this uh, doctor in North Carolina, to email us so that we could see if there are other things out there in the state that you would, you know, you'd be working in that would be adequate to protect you, too. And MedPro is not the, always the answer. There are other companies we have to work with to get People, we just want to make sure that we understand your situation and, and you do too, make a decision that's appropriate for your needs. 
great. And this one actually ties kind of back into the liability insurance, but um, a couple of our um, attendees are wondering if there's a general consensus on the type of insurance that corporate usually has for their dentist. For corporate policies, the majority of corporate policies are going to be a claims made policy. Um, they may or may not be a consent contract. Um, you know, you got to understand with corporate, probably looking more at the bottom line and not so much the overall value. Some are better than others. You know, it's hard to say exactly on on the uh, all consensus. But what I've experienced is you want to understand in your contract if you were to leave employment there. It, it, and it is a claims made policy, who buys the tail? Because when you leave employment, you're gonna have to buy the tail, or they will, depending on how the contract is structured. So you don't wanna get in a situation with a corporate where you work there for a year, and it's a claims made policy, and you're the doctor that has to buy the tail, and the tail is a multiple of a multiple of cost, and now you're stuck with maybe a $10,000 tail premium for the service that you did there at that dental dental group to be protected for anything that could come from it in the future. So you really have to do your diligence there with those corporate contracts. Um, you know, talk to an attorney viewing those. It's worth the money to have an attorney review your contract so that you're understanding what's in there to know who sever employment or they sever employment, what are the consequences for any future loss that could come from that corporate setting that you practice that, you know, for maybe a short time. I would I would say the vast majority of the time, if you're at a DSO, the doctor is going to be responsible for buying the tail, not the DSO. That's yep. typically what we see. Yep. Okay, guys. Well, it looks like that is it for all of our questions. So I would like to definitely, first and foremost, thank Christian and Andrew for participating in today's webinar. Thank you both for your enthusiasm and for seeing on through some of these questions. Of course, if anyone wants to follow up with Christian or Andrew or um, Career Compass in general, the um, email addresses are on the screen. So feel free to reach out to us with, with any additional follow-up questions. Um, we'd like to thank Taylor High School for continuing to sponsor and support um, as this Career Compass um, through their business brush-up series. Um, the next Business Brush Up Series webinar will be hosted in August. So look for information from Christian and the Tree Learn High School team for their event coming up in August. Um, the next Career Compass webinar, so we do host webinars monthly through Career Compass, will be on June 21st. And that one will be focused on communications, where we are hoping that as the members and those that participate will walk away with an understanding of how to communicate more effectively with their patients and clinical team. So again, thanks everyone for participating and we wish everyone a very enjoyable long holiday weekend. Thanks everyone and thank you, Kendra. Thanks guys. Thank you.